Good morning, friends. Time to pick up our book study again. Interior Freedom by Father Jacques Philippe. Loving this book. Oh, what am I doing? There we go. I'm gonna have a few sips of coffee and y'all can sing for me this morning. <laughs> Doesn't that look good? <clears throat> it has MCT oil in it. Collagen. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. I'm listening to you all sing. And my spirit exalts in God my Savior. With mercy on my loneliness, and my name will be forever exalted. For the mighty God has done. song brings me into worship. Good morning, everybody. I was thinking I was just going to drink my coffee and lis listen and let you all sing. But I can't not sing that song. And I haven't sung praise to God yet this morning. So I'm just going to have a couple of more sips while we wait for a few more people to join us. Maybe one more minute. And then we'll start with back with our book study, Interior Freedom by Father Jacques Philippe. Oh, I've been up since four something, so yeah. Okay, I shall begin. So we left off, I hope you all had a good weekend, by the way. Um, on page 70, 
five is where we're picking up again, I should say. We're under freedom and acceptance. You know, I was talking about this with the Lord yesterday. You all know I struggle with the whole body thing. Body, oh, 40 years of the crazy dieting, coming to, um, to grow in temperance, but also just to bless my body and to love my body, even though it's not perfect. And which is not what the culture tells us to do, right? The culture tells us to hate our bodies if they're not perfect, if they're aging, if they're pudgy, whatever. And if they're not airbrushed. And so yesterday I was just talking to the Lord about it. And that word acceptance, I just asked him just to like, anyway, asked him to help me see all of it from his perspective again. Because the enemy, he loves to get into those old wounds, right? We all have them. It's our The access point that he has to us is usually through old wounds that have yet to be fully healed. <clears throat> and, I, and I am mostly fully healed. I know the Lord has done incredible work in that area. But when I asked him that, what he started out with was what I just heard in my heart. That self-love follows self-acceptance. And that's kind of what we were talking about, right? self-acceptance in all of our imperfections we are still loved like madly so the real harm is not outside us but inside us within us at times of struggle we need also to recall the conversion we should be concerned about is not our neighbors but our own only if we take our own conversion seriously do we stand any chance of seeing our neighbor converted too? This, this point of view is realistic and encouraging. We have little real influence on other people. <laughs> Isn't that so good to remember? And our attempts to change them have only a very slight chance of success. Since most of the time we want them to change in line with our criteria and aims more than God's. If we are concerned first with our own conversion, however, we have more hope of making a difference. It does more good to seek to reform our hearts than to reform the world or the church. Everyone will benefit. Let us ask ourselves this question. To what degree can the evil in my surroundings affect me? With apologies to those I'm going to scandalize, I say that the evil around us the sins of others, of people in the church, of society, does not become an evil for us unless, unless we let it penetrate our hearts. Okay, I'm a little bit scandalized by that, but let's read on. The point isn't that we should become indifferent, just the opposite. The holer we are, the more we will suffer due to the evil and sin in the world. Oh. But external evil only harms us to the degree we react badly to it. So I'm still wounded. We're all going to be wounded by the sin in the church and in the world. And it seems that the Lord, the more the Lord shares his heart with me, the more I'm, I'm wounded by that. I suffer with him over that. But external evil only harms us, like really does harm to weep over that is not harm. It, it breaks our hearts, but it's actually love. It's a response of love. But it only harms us to the degree we react badly to it by fear, worry, discouragement, sadness, giving up, rushing to apply hasty solutions that don't solve anything, judging, fostering bitterness and resentment, refusing to forgive, and so on. Jesus says in St. Mark's Gospel, There is nothing outside a man which, by going into him, can defile him, but the things which come out of a man are what defile him. Harm does not come to us from the external circumstances, but from how we react to them interiorly. What ruins our souls is not what happens outside, but the echo that it awakes within us. The harm that other people do to me never comes from them, it comes from me. Should I say that again? I think I shall. The harm that other people 
do to me never comes from them, it comes from me. Harm is only self-inflicted, the fathers of the church said long ago. Okay, so let me just apply this to a practical situation and let's work this out. (coughs) My house was broken into. They like violated our space. They stole my television set. They stole a beautiful diamond ring I I inherited from my mother-in-law, my late mother-in-law, and other jewelry. They stole my favorite pillowcase. That's unforgivable. I'm kidding. But they used the pillowcase to put the jewelry in. Not that I had a whole lot, but still, you know. So Lord Jesus, that harm does not come from them breaking into my house and from stealing these things, from violating our space, but from how I react to it interiorly. So I would say that the Lord might invite me to say fiat. Pray for them. These people are in desperate situations. Whether it's drug addiction and they're, they need to feed their addiction They need to feed their families. I actually did thank God that not more was messed up or taken. Um, It was almost like they did it respectfully, if that can be a thing. That's how I interpret it anyway, because like they opened the drawers, but then they closed them back. They didn't leave everything just ransacked and, and ripped apart. Okay. The harm that other people do to me never comes from them. It comes from me. Harm is only self inflicted. Let's read on. Our complicity increases the harm. When we concentrate too much on something that isn't right and make it our main topic of conversation, hmm, we end up giving evil more substance than it has. I know that there are people who can get fixated on a particular injustice and that's all they want to talk about. Deploring evil sometimes only strengthens it. I recently heard a priest say, I'm not going to spend my life denouncing sin. That would be doing it too much honor. Hmm. I would rather encourage good than condemn evil. I like that. That's my, I would say that is my philosophy as well. And I think he was right. This is not a head in the sand attitude, but the optimism of charity. Bye. Bye. Love you. God bless you. Keep you. Make his face to shine on you. May his angels watch over you. May he be gracious to you. Give me peace. And Mother Mary. Wrap you in her mantle. Sorry. Sorry about what? Uh oh. Oh, your room? Yeah. Mm. Love you too. It's like a tornado hitting that room. Okay. This is not a head in the sand attitude, but the optimism of charity. Love is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. As we ourselves advance more surely and effectively by giving ourselves totally to the good despite our defects, so also we do more to help others experience conversion and make progress by encouraging them in the positive aspects of their lives than by condemning their errors Good is more real than evil. Oh, let's say that again. Good is more real than evil. And it can overcome evil. Light overcomes the darkness. Yes. We sometimes experience a savage satisfaction in detecting and showing up something wrong. We know that attitude. The resentment and bitterness we feel arise from a spiritual void within us and the sense of dissatisfaction it produces. Often the most critical people are those with the greatest spiritual emptiness. So that's when we get criticized by people and it really stings. It really was a matter of grace that the Lord started teaching me to pray for them. That was an opportunity for me to pray for them. And then doing that, somehow it's kind of pushed that outside. If there was some truth to what they said, I had to deal with that. But if not, if it was really about them, it helped me get rid of the ugh, yuck 
and just pray for them and ask the Lord to bless them, to heal them, whatever it was that they needed. And I really think that's such a great attitude whenever a wrong is done to us, to see it as an invitation by God who allowed it to happen for us to pray for them because maybe no one else is and their salvation might depend on our prayer and the sacrifice that we're offering, that suffering that they've caused us, offered back to God, united to his cross and love for them. Whoa, is that heroic, right? That's the path of the saints, and it frees us. Um, often the most, okay, one wonders whether they must create enemies for themselves in order to exist. Hmm. Evil comes to fill a gap. Jesus was surrounded by a sea of evil, hatred, violence, and lies. His heart was broken and pierced, and he suffered more than anyone has ever suffered. Ever. But the wrong done to him did not penetrate. I would say the only one that came close was Mary. The wrong done to him did not penetrate him because his heart was full of trust in his father, abandonment, and loving self offering. We should follow in his steps. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. So too with Our Lady at the foot of the cross. She drank the cup of suffering, but her heart remained pure. It held no fear, no rebellion, no hatred, no despair, but only acceptance, forgiveness, and hope. If the wrongs people commit do penetrate our hearts, that is because they find room there. If suffering makes us bitter and ill-humored, It is because our hearts are devoid of faith, hope, and love. But if our hearts are filled with total trust in God and love for him and our neighbor, there is no room for evil, room there for evil, hurt, and harm. St. Maximilian Kolbe died in the starvation bunker at Auschwitz, but his heart remained pure and intact. In that hellish place, because he felt no hatred for his executioners and consented to give up his life for love. He and his companions sang the Magnificat, what we sing every morning, as they were dying. All right, Jesus, I'm asking for that grace right now, that when I'm dying, I will be able to sing the Magnificat. Amen. They conquered evil with good. And then the next paragraph I wrote, how, with big star, this is how we do that. The ability to remain untouched by evil is not acquired all at once. It is the fruit of a long process of self-conquest and grace that makes us grow in the theological virtues. It is an aspect of spiritual maturity, more a gift from God than the result of our efforts. But this gift will be given to us more quickly and surely the more we strive for it, desire it, and try to practice the attitudes described here, rooting ourselves in God through faith and prayer. So important. Rooting ourselves in God through through faith and prayer. Not blaming people and things around us for what isn't going well in our lives. And stop seeing ourselves as victims. No more. Stop. Mm -mm. As soon as we start the poor me, stop. God is good. Thank you, Jesus. I praise you and I thank you for this thorn. We need to start retraining our thoughts, right? Um, Resolutely shouldering responsibilities and accepting our lives as they are. Accepting our bodies as they are. Our weaknesses as they are and using our present capacity for believing, hoping, and loving to the full at every moment. The Royal Freedom of God's Children. For those of you who are just joining us, we're reading from Interior Freedom by Father Jacques Philippe. In baptism, we are anointed with sweet-smelling oil as the sign of our new character. By our union with Christ, each of us is priest, prophet, and king. We are kings because we are children and heirs of the king of heaven and earth, but also in the sense that we are subject 
to nothing. And everything is subject to us. Okay, let's read on. This is what happens to us when we let the grace of baptism operate in us. Living as God's children in faith, hope, and love. Yes, we know suffering and sorrow, but everything that happens serves to make us grow in love and in fact of being God's children, in the fact of being God's children. What happens and how others behave can no longer touch us negatively. They can only promote our true good, which is to love. Have you ever thought about that? But that's what it means to be a king, priest, prophet, king, as God's children, that nothing can touch us. It all can be used for the good. We may know suffering, but all of it will be used for the good for those who, who love God and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28, which by now I'm sure you've all memorized. Or you're working on it. St. Paul expresses that sense of royal freedom, the privilege of Christians living in the arms of God our Father by saying, all things are yours. And he adds, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. This also is beautifully expressed by St. John of the Cross in his prayer of the soul in love. Why do you hesitate? Why do you wait? For you can from this instant love God in your heart. Mine are the heavens and mine is the earth and mine are the peoples. The just are mine and mine are the sinners. The angels are mine and the mother of God and all things are mine. And God himself is mine and for me, because Christ is mine and holy for me. What do you ask for then, and what do you seek, my soul? All of that is yours and for you. Whoa, isn't that gorgeous? We can meditate on that. I I ran into a cousin years ago that I hadn't seen, just she lives in another state, and she said, when I was little, like about two years old, she took me to Audubon Park on St. Charles Avenue and put me on the jungle gym. And there were other kids there and I stood on the top and I said, mine swing, (laughs) mine, it's mine. So I think I had just gotten a brand new baby sister at that point. And so I was just like trying to establish what was mine, but all the world is ours. The world is our oyster because we are children of God. <clears throat> That's a beautiful prayer. I'm going to reread that later. <coughs> okay, part two, the present moment. The present moment is a good time to have coffee. Number one, we're going to do seven more minutes. Freedom and the present moment. One of the essential conditions of interior freedom is the ability to live in the present moment. For one thing, it is only then that we can exercise freedom. We have no hold on the past. We can't change the smallest bit of it. People sometimes try to relive past events considered failures. I should have done this. I should have said that. But those imaginary scenarios are merely dreams. It is not possible to backtrack. And by the way, that just like robs you of joy and time and precious valuable time. The only free act we can make in regard to the past is to accept it just as it was and leave it trustingly in God's hands. Let me say that one more time. The only free act we can make in regard to the past is to accept it. Lord, give us the grace to say fiat. Just as it was. And leave it trustingly in God's hands. We have very little hold on the future either. Despite all our foresight, plans, and promises, It takes very little to change everything completely. Hello, coronavirus. We can't program life in advance, but can only receive it moment by moment. All we have is the present moment. Right now, we possess this and this alone. Here is the only place where we can make free acts. Only in the present moment Are we truly in contact with reality? Someone might think it tragic that the present is so fleeting and neither the past nor the future really belongs to us. 
but approached from the standpoint of Christian faith and hope. The present moment is rich in grace and holds immense reassurance. This is where God is present. I am with you always to the close of the age. God is the eternal present. Every moment, whatever it brings, is filled with God's presence. I like to see the light in the room like God is here. He's now rich with the possibility of communion with God. We do not commune with God in the past or in the future, but by welcoming each instant as the place where he gives himself to us. We should learn to live in each moment as sufficient to itself, for God is there. And if God is there, we lack nothing. We feel we are missing this or that, simply because we are living in the past or in the future instead of dwelling in each second. Psalm 145 says, The eyes of all look to thee, and thou givest them their food in due season. Thou openest thy hand, thou satisfiest the desire of every living thing. There's something very liberating in this understanding of the grace of the present moment. Even if the whole of our past has been a disaster, even if our future seems like a dead end, now we can establish communion with God through an act of faith, trust, and abandonment. Right now, just say with me, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. God is eternally present, eternally young, eternally new, and our past and future are his. The sun's getting my eyes. Let me close this real quick. I got my drapes mounted back on the wall. Thank you very much after pulling them down. He can forgive everything, purify everything, renew everything. Oh, isn't that good news? God can renew everything. He will renew you in his love. In the present moment, because of his infinitely merciful love, we always have the possibility of starting again, not impeded by the past or tormented by the future. The past is in the hands of the merciful God who can draw benefit from everything, everything, all. The future is in the hands of the providence of God who will never forget us. He never forgets you. Never. He couldn't. If he, if he forgot you, you wouldn't exist anymore. So the fact that you're here means that God is thinking of you. Faith keeps us from living as many people do. Thinking of you and loving you, that keeps you in existence. Faith keeps us from living as many people do, oppressed by a burdensome past and worrisome future. Living in the present permits our hearts to expand. That's a good place for us to stop. So, let me read that one more time because it's so rich, it's so true, it's so deep. Can we grab onto faith? Faith is a gift from God. So let's ask Lord Jesus, we ask for more faith. To believe that you're truly here with us, Lord. That you're pouring your love into us like the sunlight pouring through the window right now. Always in the present moment, pouring your love into us. Caring for us. Lord, we entrust our past to you, to your merciful love. We entrust our future to your great providence. And so we can rest in this present moment with you. And we put everything in your hands. Jesus, I trust in you. Amen. Amen. So it's faith faith that frees us from the regret of the past and the fear of the future. It's the gift of the present moment. Are we okay right now in this moment? Okay. God is with you. He's with me right now. And he'll be there tomorrow. And we just leave the past in his hands. Amen. Amen. All right, friends, I'm going to play a song. What shall I? And read your comments, and I'm gonna go to mass. I feel like the Lord is really inviting me to lean in.
to use the phrase du jour to his providence, to his grace, to his strength, and not to my own, which is so weak. Right? We lean on him. Okay, what shall I play? It's such a gorgeous day outside. Let's see, I'm looking to surrender. And I shall just, I think I'll do Psalm of Mercy. Thanks for being with me today. I'm gonna to read your comments and go to mass. So it'll be a great day. I'll be back tomorrow. So if any of you want to hear Pachi Talbot from Ecuador, my visionary friend, who's under the guidance of her archbishop, they're building a shrine, like it's, it's the real deal, like a St. Bernadette. If you want to hear her speak in Louisiana, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, sign up for my blog. I'll be posting all of the dates and locate the times and locations on my blog today or tomorrow. Someone chokes you, it does not come from you, but your reaction to it, that's what you have control over. So we might physically suffer from someone hurting us, right? But, and we might suffer in our, our hearts for the evil in the world, but whether we allow it to damage us with fear, or worry, resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, that is our choice. And that's what causes additional suffering. It's our response to it. That's how I understand it anyway. Pachi's message will not be live streamed. <clears throat> They're real concerned about, apparently in the past, people have twisted her words and edited things and you can imagine all of hell hates her. So, um, no, she, nothing can be recorded or broadcast. Sorry. Though, if you Google her name, there are some things some of her speaking, though it's in Spanish. I think there might be some translations. Okay, friends, that's it for me. Hope you have a great day. I love the blue sky. Oh, it makes me happy in January. Oh, it's February. Yay, we're out of January. Just January is always hard for me. All right, hope you have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow.